and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creating the science fiction setting, um, Shin. Sorry, it's Zin. Zin. sorry, it's Zin. <laughs> Zin. Oh, and creating the art of the art and lore of it, as well as well as a digital art book for the matter. The one and only Forge. How you doing today, man? I'm tired. I'm sleepy. I'm good. Good to be You're gonna change your name. I think you can do better than sleepy. Uh huh. <laughs> sure. I just came back from you know a long time of uh, working mm -hmm. for today. Catching up on all the the holiday uh, work to do. Oh, and I understand. I understand completely. I just, I had to, you know, meme. Meme. Don't let your dreams be memes. Don't but let your memes be dreams. Something like that. Since, since Zen is meant to be a science fiction story, I'm, from what I'm seeing, I'm guessing that it is leaning into space opera. I guess you could say that uh, there's a lot of different science fiction uh, elements that of like uh, 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 things that I love that definitely play a hand in uh, it's everything that's come together with Zen, um, from like Alien, Predator, The Thing, mm -hmm. Terminator, different stuff like that. Like Star Wars, yeah. So a little bit of uh, I don't know if uh, sci-fi like space opera is like the right thing to say for it, but. Maybe it's uh, it, there's different. There's a bunch of different stories, and they can definitely be interpreted in different ways. Yeah, well, it's one of those things where there, there's there's going to be a lot of influences in it in any work, but there's always going to be that one, that um one set that acts acts as kind of a, acts as kind of a foundation. Right. Um, I'm not saying that because it's space that because this is in the space opera genre that it's trying to be exactly like Star Wars or something like that. Not Right, that's just the one title I throw out there as I, I know it's being a space opera and I don't know of any others. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't really used the term used on anything else. Technically speaking, ha technically speaking, um, Halo would count as a space opera. Yeah, I guess it could. Oh. You're right. You know, de dealing with space, dealing with larger-than-life ca characters, that's a space opera to a T. And Starship Troopers, it can, even if it's military leaning, I'd say I'd say it can count as that, especially if you count the expanded material beyond just the first book or the or the movie. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not in whether or not you want to count the movie is another is another matter entirely because the movie has <laughs> almost almost fuck all to do with the original story. Exactly. Yeah, I've I've actually uh, never read the book. Um, love the movie though. <laughs> I know about what the book is about. I, I've looked into some sorts of uh, stuff for it. I was just like, eh, I like the movie better. <laughs> um, but that's not really fair because yeah. it's not even the same thing. So I can't really say that I like it better. It's I'm, just something. It's. I will always be name. a little. I will <laughs> always be a little bit disappointed that the when I read when I read the book and then I because I read the book first and then I saw the movie. And, and you're like, the, what is this? <laughs> well, the th the thing that really disappointed me is that is that there was no presence of the armored division. Yeah. Of the of the armored infantry, just the mobile infantry in the navy. Yeah. And I will admit part of the reason why I wanted to see the armored armored infantry is mechs. But also yeah. just if you're doing if you're doing that kind of ground war, you're going to have ve you're going to have vehicles, it's not just going to be grunts and um, ships in the sky. No, man, just grunts all the time, everywhere. Fine. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I understand. Wh I understand why that wasn't done in the movie because getting the because getting the kind of prop work for those kind of vehicles would be ridiculously expensive. I think it also helped uh, that like it. Uh, it was kind of the the point, you know, is that like it, it was the mobile infantry because they were just like, oh man, they're just a bunch of bugs up in space. What what's the worst they could do? And then heart learn uh, learn the hard way. <laughs> yep, the the whole thing with the um, Kandaflu drop. Oh, and it is it is funny that you br that you bring up um, 
stuff like Alien, stuff like Terminator, um, especially given some of the stories invo involved with that, like how, like how, um, <laughs> with, with I've told I've told the story before with the ter with the Terminator, um, Cameron spent half the time trying to get Schwarzenegger off the project and then half the time trying to get him back on the project, <laughs> even telling his roommate at one point, "Hey, do I owe you any, do I owe you any money? Because I'm about to pick a fight with Conan." <laughs> Because, and I realize this is ridiculous, but th but believe me when I say this. Originally, the person who was originally pitched to be the Terminator was O.J. Simpson. Well, that's something. <laughs> uh, the only reason it did the only reason it didn't happen was Cameron had said he didn't think O.J. looked like a killer. Dang. <laughs> Which, um, Dang. <laughs> foreshadowing? Yeah. Surprise. I can think of 12 Probably people better who might agree with that. Probably better that, so, you know, he decided not to. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, no, at one, at one point, Schwarzenegger was going to play Kyle Reese. Ah, okay. Which, I think that would, I think that would have been... That would have been funny, but it also would have been a disaster. Yeah, a little bit. I, it would be a little goofy. Um, because this this would have been Schwarzenegger's third film, and yeah. in both of them he wasn't. Schwarzenegger's never really been a speaking actor, right? And he, he's there to look good doing action stuff. Yeah. A role like a role like Kyle Reese would just be completely out of his depth. And I know he was trying to branch out, but. You can't. There is a thing like there is a thing about punching above your weight class, right? Uh, iron ironic given that there's a whole weightlifting classic named after him, but that's another story. Of course, the funnier thing was because of a miscommunication when it came to the prop work. The Terminator skeleton, which was supposed to be made of um, of fiberglass and a, with a chrome finish. You know, so it looks metallic, but it's relatively light. Instead, it was made with cast made with um cast iron. Yeah. And to make it even worse, they were guerrilla filming at night. Beautiful. You know, so no no permits, and now you got a prop <laughs> that that is too heavy for one person to move. It took three people to move to move the prop on on and off set. I should have just asked Arnold. He would have done it. <laughs> given given how much you got to move that thing around when you're doing stop motion, I think even him. I think even he would have issues. <laughs> oh, especially especially given some of the some of the other problems. Like it's still it's still going to be slow moving, and um, one guy carrying that thing is going to draw some attention. And again, so will three guys, but. <laughs> Right. But you've been working on this particular setting for uh, for about 20 plus years. I'm curious what the impetus to actually ma actually make the setting was. Um so I, I actually thought about that this morning. I realized that 20 years would have made me uh 12. Um so it's actually been 15 years. Um so I started thinking about uh kind of like the the prototype for zen back when i was in about my senior year in high school and it was kind of just something that was brought on inspired by i was i i, I was I, I did a lot more drawing back then than i do now um and i was listening to uh a lot of pink floyd at the time and a lot of like when listening to music it would just kind of like pop up so like i just day daydream some stuff uh so I think I believe I was listening to the wall track and the the, tra the specific track was what we uh, what will we do now um and I just had this this kind of daydream of like a sci-fi war setting um because Zen's originally uh, original working title was uh, actually kill um you know I was about 17 years old at the time and I didn't I, I, I didn't have like any idea it was just kind of like something I was tossing around in my head um and it, it's uh, it's done a lot of changing back and forth since then um uh, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, so it's it's done a lot. Of, like I said, a lot of evolution over the the fifteen years, and it was only just I believe last year that I came up with uh, that I had changed the name to uh, Zen, and got to a point where I am now where I can actually start really turning out the uh, the ideas a little bit more because uh, the I'm when it comes to creating the story, I'm much more of a uh, a visual storyteller than I am a, a writer. Um, I don't mind writing. It's not 100% my most favorite thing. But uh, the, uh, for example, the last thing that I actually did any writing for was a, uh, a, pro a, a little free project that I was working with uh, for a alien comic that I called Xenomorph uh, Lucky Star. And because I like to be very descriptive with my writing, I found that that actually worked out pretty well to translate from what I had written into uh, comic pages. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, it seems like I could write something that's basically a written version of storyboarding. Um, and that's kind of where we're at with uh, why I did this Kickstarter is to, to do this digital art book was mm. that the, the, the whole part, point of the project is it's all to fund the concept arts for it. Because even though I do like to draw, for whatever reason, my mind and my hand have not gotten along very well with one another, and I just... I, I can sketch roughly now, but I can't draw the same way that I used to. I feel like it's kind of something that's degenerated over time. So the Kickstarter actually funds the artist who I am currently working with, uh, Blasboros. Um, so that's the funds go pretty much all go to him. I don't, I, I'm not giving any, uh, any of the funds to myself. I I'm using it like a hundred percent towards, uh, creating the characters and doing world building and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Now with that, with that in mind, how long? Was it was it a case where early on you had written it as a story before writing kind of a setting bible for for it, or was it the other way around? It was kind of um, a, a, just a bunch of sketches and drawings that I had done, as well as like some kind of short, uh, like a short story. Or the 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 original concept was that the, it took place in a you know a sci fi Earth, um, where there were were we were being uh, basically it was kind of like a you know like an alien invasion type scenario but uh after humans had uh, you know uh, fought against whoever was invading they discovered that oh hey uh these aren't aliens they're actually uh humans and there was kind of like a little bit they went into that about like cloning and stuff uh, that's uh there there were aliens that had brought other humans into uh fight on their home planet basically to try and take it over that way mm -hmm. um it's a, it's a little uh, foggy on what Kill was then versus what Zen is now. There, uh, that, that I did I did some uh, some like short little comic things that I've lost a, a long time ago. I used because uh, I drew on you know pen uh, pencil paper mm -hmm. before I started doing digital art. So yeah. all that stuff is long gone after moving a few times. Yeah, and the reason why I open with that is. Developing a science fiction setting is a series of questions. And the right. answers to those questions prompt even more questions. Yes, it's unending. <laughs> it's unending, but from my perspective, that's what's exciting. Yeah. Especially when you've answered enough of those and you and all of a sudden you have this this fully realized wor world that become becomes a sandbox to tell stories in. Right. You know what some people might find sc find scary because it's a bunch of unknowns, is ra is rather exciting because it's a bunch of unknowns. <laughs> right, and then once you so once I get to like you get to a point where like you, you get one question answered, then you just are then presented like with what you said uh, uh, more questions. Mm -hmm. It's like like so uh, you since since you brought up the idea that the quote unquote alien invasion was actually cloned was actually cloned um humans and you're bringing in stuff like the terminator in involved with this um 
I'll start with that one because that's a, that's a minefield to go through. How do you handle time travel if you do? Oh, I'm sorry. That's I didn't mean that it was directly like uh, uh, like Terminator. I'm just saying that there were just inspirations that came yeah. from uh, different sci-fi's like like Terminator and Aliens and Predator and Starship Troopers. The thing. So time travel is not is not a thing within the time unit. travel is not a thing. All right. Okay. That's that. That takes that one off the list, which, in a roundabout way, I'm glad because time travel is a minefield. Yeah, time travel is uh, is it's been done a lot, so it's kind of hard to find a new and interesting way to do it. Well, it's been even if it hadn't been done a lot, the problem is there's it's a mess of contradictions and plot holes waiting to happen. That even right. even stories with time travel that I like can fall under their own weight with enough scrutiny. Right. Um. One of the rare exceptions, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen it, and I don't, I don't blame you because this one really fell under the radar, was an indie film called Primer back in 2004. Nope. Which was very, very strict about its rules regarding time travel, and was very grounded about it. But even with that, it's not like you could travel back to, what, to when your parents were getting it on or something like that. This wasn't Back to the Future. Right. You could only travel the furthest back you could travel was six hours, and at the end of that six six hour time frame, you had to go right back into that same box to cr to essentially close the loop. Hmm. Oh. Actually, I have to correct myself. It wasn't six hours; it was two hours. Okay, that's. <laughs> so what's the point, even? <laughs> well, one of the, well one of the things was that was them using what they knew to um mess around to take advantage of the stock market <laughs> ah okay you know or or, or similar low t low tier effects like i said it wasn't trying to do the baby hitler argument right oh and of of course so, of course some stories go into the whole multiverse theory when it comes to time when it comes to time travel or how or divergences right. Branching, or bottle yeah, effect, yeah, butterfly effects. Stuff, yeah. Again, eventually the whole thing just falls under its own weight. Yeah. <laughs> this is the reason why nobody tries to create a codified timeline of events for, say, Doctor Who. Right. They just th anyone who tries eventually will throw up their hands and say, I give up. Somebody else can do this. I'm going to go <laughs> this get This is somebody drunk. else's mess now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nope. So yeah, none, none, none of that with uh, for Zen. There's uh, there's no there's no time travel. Um, there's there's been periods where uh, I had originally considered it being you know within our own universe in our own galaxy. Um, then I was just like, okay, I don't. It's like then I started thinking about things like uh, like you know history and the real world events going on now. I was like, hmm, maybe it's actually better to go the uh, the alternate route where you know. It's a different galaxy and a different universe where humans happen to exist on a different planet. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of left it up in the air at the moment with where I am currently. So I've, I've dialed it back on the scale from it being a, like a galaxy spanning thing to a, uh, it's kind of, it's all contained on a singular world now. Um, mm -hmm. Where the humans of this world are not naturally occurring. Well, actually, n none of the sentient beings, uh, pretty much, I would say all of life on this world is not naturally occurring. It is all cultivated together because this planet is also not natural. It is a big uh, technological sphere with uh, a bunch of different environments on it that separate one another and uh, different alien races that are here for reasons unknown and are not sure who put them there or why. So um, the, the the planet is artificial. Yes, it is. Uh, it is a satellite of a gas giant. Mm -hmm. And the so the I know for certain that uh, there are these large hovering spires that are basically where each of these races come from. Like the, uh, uh, their their cultivation came from these spires. They they, they have to pretty much reform civilization and then they start getting into their own uh independence uh issues with one another and kind of almost like just going through a, a new history all over uh repeating itself because they're ignorant to their own history um mm -hmm. but uh so 
I guess uh, I don't know where to uh, I don't know where to go from that. I, I guess I, yeah. I I need more. <laughs> so since it's ta since it's taking place on the on this one um this this one artificial planet, that brings me to a few questions about about said planets. You mentioned it's you mentioned that each of the each of, that the planet is full of a bunch of different biomes. Is it is it are the biomes separated naturally or is it kind of separated the way th um themed areas in a theme park are separated? Um, so the, uh, if you get to the furthest outreach of each of the biomes, you would come across these uh, these massive um, technological walls. Pretty much, they would have passages on the uh, like ways to get through, but they do uh, they they are like a, a separation from like each segment because uh, like each area is basically a large hexagon. So if you were to look at uh, the planet stripped away of all the uh, or, uh, the satellite, rather, uh, uh, stripped away of all the what looks like natural occurring terrain. Um, it would look like a big metal soccer ball, pretty much. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and at each of the and at each of the edges of those are these walls that contain the the, the biomes and environments that are better suited towards each race there. But because each race there is also been, uh, they're essentially clones that uh, modified modified clones. They uh, they are able to live like if they were to pass through into a different biome they'd be able to live and prosper there yeah that make that makes sense right. now i think the the next question would be um passage of time so is it a is it a 24 hour day and night cycle is the is the is a day and night cycle as artificial as the planet is how how does it work with that um a lot of the, uh, uh, I would say just for the sake of making things easier, I, I would just probably keep it re uh, related to like a twenty-four hour day day night cycle. Twenty-four um, twenty-four hour day night day night cycle. Tw tw um, the twelve and twelve pro probably three hundred and sixty-five day um, solar year. Right, but just for the sake of not getting too uh, <laughs> too. Um, no, that's a good word. Oh, a good word for it, but uh, oh. ma making it easier to follow. Would you have? Does it have um seasons in the same way? Since keep in mind the big reason why we have the season the seasons in a year on Earth is because the Earth is um rotating on an axis. Right, so we're on a wobble. Yeah, the uh, the environments are because they are artificial. The env uh, their uh, seasons would be artificial as well. Basically, the only thing that would be uh, that's mostly natural is the uh, the light. But mm -hmm. you would also, because it is by a, uh, by a big gas giant, uh, nighttime's probably a little brighter than it would normally be on some certain nights, depending on what time of the year it is. <laughs> so when, when we say bright, are we t are we talking brighter than than say ambient light during a full moon night? Yeah, uh, if you could imagine the if uh, if the if any of the sun is shining on the gas giant up in the night sky, it would definitely make nighttime brighter <laughs> yeah. for us on the ground yeah that's that certainly makes sense since i know it i know it's if we're i know it's earth-like when it comes to passage of time but there's no moon in the traditional sense so that would right. that would be something to take into consideration especially since yeah. some cultures here on earth ha had developed calendars based on lunar cycles in fact a lot of earth a lot of early calendars were built were built around that rather than solar cycles. Right. Yeah. So the other moons of the gas giant would be they'd be around, but the satellite doesn't have it, its own satellite. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a subsatellite. Um, yeah. But the but it does help with uh, they, they they don't they only have to kind of redevelop their cultures um, to an extent uh, because these uh, modified clones uh, have uh, basically I'm using genetic memory. That uh, mm -hmm. they they know enough to get by from where from the where their original host race was. So, for example, uh, if you were one of these humans, you would know what a car is, but you wouldn't know the human history behind the car. But you'd but you'd be able to get into a car, turn, know know to turn the engine, know how the stick works, and so on. 
Right. If you were one of the first generation humans that I, I should also mention, because uh, at the time of the story, the, uh, it has been a, a couple hundred years. Um, so the, the first generation of people who came from this are, are long gone. And now the people who are there have also have had to have been taught in school the same way that you and I do uh, to learn how to do these things. Mm hmm. And the, the now given given that would it be fair how long would it be fair to say that since you mentioned first generation humans that there's been multiple generations on this planet to the point where they have the, where they've developed their own cultures out absent the for lack of a better term source material yes um so the first generation were uh, like were, came from the spire directly and everybody afterward were all just born naturally through mm -hmm. procreation all right so i'm get so i'm guessing that through that you that's where you end up having the foundation of different nations within that within this planet right because there's definitely a variety of of outfits and designs and since since they're all on this particular planet, I'm guessing that most of the storytelling is focused on this particular world and some of the satellite, some of the adjacent areas, there isn't really anything like FTL travel. Um, so the spires, I do plan on eventually uh, uh, expanding beyond just this world. Uh, so the, the spires are actually ships and that is how they will be able to leave and go beyond into space. The, so the, colony the ships. Yeah, so there, uh, there, there is actually a race or two that uh, are alien that are actually not cultivated on this world. There's, a, there's just one that happens to live in that solar system, and then one that comes from uh, outside the solar system. Um, haven't really put them into there, but uh, I've been playing with their designs a little bit. They're some, they're just something fun that I've gotten into to explore mm -hmm. for additional stories. Um, and then when you look at some of the, um, I'm assuming you're looking at some of the art that's on the uh, the Kickstarter, like the exploring human designs. Um, yeah. So pretty much everything that I put on there is, um, not obviously not finalized, but uh, they're just exploring different uh, ideas from the time and time uh, where I was thinking of trying to take a almost diesel punk approach to the humans. Um, I think I may modify it and expand a little bit on that instead of being a little more World War II -y, it might be a little closer to like uh, uh, a little a little bit after that probably um, th there's definitely uh, some other explo uh, exploration there I don't think I put in one or the other that's right mm -hmm. there were sketches so I didn't put them in but there's some of these other humans I have that's are they're just called the Adrift who are not uh aligned with any uh governments that are out there but they're, they're actually just these uh these workers that go on these big uh mobile rigs that harvest the resources and end up being you know paid for their work so they, they spend all their lives living on these and they eventually go to these different camps that's just a an example of one of the other uh, human factions out there mm-hmm now continue now continuing on from that when it comes to when it comes to tech, when it comes to the technology levels you mentioned that is it is it a case where there's different technology levels across the across the planet or is it largely yes. unified into a more futuristic style there are there are definitely different uh, uh technology tiers uh, a good example of that are these uh I don't think they're so they're in the uh updates i i included some more art to talk about some of the other uh things i had done uh so as in, uh, the update says uh, some additional pre-kickstarter art um down towards the bottom the uh there's uh two races uh where one that uh, contrasts with uh the humans pretty well are are called the peely um they're kind of like a saurian uh alien race they are the lowest technologically from when they're introduced here so their their host race was about uh they were pretty much uh, tribal um like a lot of uh like if you could think of like uh, a modern day um 
Pacific Islander kind of mm-hmm. setting. Yeah. Where the, the like they they may know of certain technology, but they don't. Uh, they haven't really developed anything very high on their own. Um, whereas like where, where humans are exploiting the uh, unique resources of this planet to have aircraft and uh, these uh, those uh, those giant mining barges I was talking about, the uh, big mining rigs. Mm-hmm. So. With that in mind, have in development of this, did you end up um try um sketching together a world map? Not obviously, not obviously not a full detailed one, but just a idea of to show where things are. Um, we've got I've gone through a, a few uh back before I dis uh, decided to do this particular world. Uh, it's kind of going to be a culmination of all the other world maps I did for what were supposed to be the home worlds of each race. Um, so it'll be, it would be some, somewhat Earth-like, but lo- it would also look like, if you were looking at it from space, it'd look like it was patched together into, you know, from the art- the artificial point of it. But, uh, like, for, for where humans are, we, uh, we have you know, we have our mountains in a very Earth-like area another race called the uh the Eritor would have something that's a little bit more akin to a uh almost uh an almost i don't know how i want to describe this if you can imagine like what a lush mars would look like where it's still kind of like drying out and red and almost barren but you've got pocket uh pockets of uh um plant life and such like oasis is um, but as far as like a full map goes, uh, that's one of the things that I definitely wanted to work on as soon as possible was uh, putting, uh, getting a new map together for this. So that way, obviously, I can plot out who who lives where, who their neighbors are, and uh, who would, who would interact with each other. How I, re- mm-hmm. I already know a little bit ahead of uh, ahead of time that uh, for uh, the Peely and the Eritor are pretty close to the the humans. Yeah. Now speaking of technology levels, oh. Is have th- have certain factions evolved evolved enough to the point where they're using energy weapons, or is it still relatively um, solid projectiles when it comes to things like firearms? There is one race that has energy projectiles, and they are kind of one of the last ones the humans come across. Mm-hmm. Um, the so uh, the the entity who is control there's actually an entity that's kind of in control of the entire world of what's everything that's going on has intentionally been keeping everybody from getting to a certain point. But with this one particular race, well, they already were at that point. So they had to start off that way again, because they already, their genetic memory was already there. So they've been having a tough time. (laughs) uh, A lot of the, the efforts is going into keeping them on the planet for the, for the time being. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, for example, uh, humans have tried to launch things into space only for it to get uh, knocked out of the sky pretty quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, th- esen- essentially the way you're describing it is almost almost like the planet is like a prison planet, for lack yeah. of a better term. Uh-huh. It's uh, I I, w- I would describe it as a war world. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I'm get I'm guessing that there's quite there's quite a bit of um, conflict between the, between the different factions on the planet because of that um, nature of being a war world. Right. So uh, so starting off with we got the the humans fighting well, uh, fighting each other. Um, well, there. So the 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 first conflict that the humans came across were these uh, these creatures that are called the Zir. Um, which are very Starship Troopers inspired, um, g- giant bug forms. Um, so once that kind of got in, under control and the uh, humans started forming, be- becoming more organized and forming larger government parties, then there started to be uh, being a divergence in uh, what people wanted. So we had you end up with like uh, two major factions and uh, going to war with one another between the humans. 
and then it starts to branch out once they pass their border into the other biomes and discovering oh we're not alone here we're not there's more than just humans it turns out there's some other aliens out here now then you get the uh conflicts between the aliens and the humans and then also more again with human on human because you know you may have some people who are like hey there's other races out there we should learn from them and work together um and see you know see who's on top of things and you then you might get to the opposite uh and for some humans where they're like nah man humans are should be on top uh screw the other races and xenophobia basically <laughs> So, with the, with that in mind, I'm looking at some of the designs, and of of course, I couldn't help but notice that you had more human stuff in one of the images. Is a ro is a robot, or at least something very robot looking, unless that's supposed to be a mech. Oh uh, yeah, You're does, about the black and yellow one. Yeah does the does the setting have um full, have full AI or is it a soft AI kind of like the virtual AIs in, or virtual intelligence? in Mass Effect. So humans do have um, smart AI. And uh, so that guy is a combat drone, basically. But he does have a smart enough AI to uh, that he, he can make decisions on his own. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about, uh, I believe the, the robot's name was Case in uh, Inter was it Interstellar. So yeah, I think so. I think so. It's been a yeah. while since I've seen so, Interstellar. So about uh, yeah, they they can be as smart as that. Mm -hmm. Um, this one's a little a little bit, you know, he he he's he's got his own personality to be programmed to be uh, to get along well with soldiers and have you know that same kind of uh, camaraderie and mm -hmm. humor that they would. Um. So yeah, we got so we got some AI for uh, for the humans for sure. Mm-hmm. And since since Halo was brought up, obviously there's the concept of smart AIs in that in that series. But the fact that um, smart AIs are on a I think I think it was a seven a seven year lifespan because of how rampancy works. Um, and I'm cur I'm curious if there's a similar th lifespan threat when it comes to AI in th in this setting, or if that's not really something that's present for some of the there so uh, the, the ai are kind of a, a little bit of a newer thing for the humans um if you look at the uh the cyborgs for example uh mm -hmm. that are a little bit lower down they are on the end of uh ai experimentation where um you know that's where that's something that's where we start to get into a little bit of terminator uh where they do get some degeneration uh, uh degeneration and they were trying to research on the way to like make them work better and you end up with a bunch of uh crazy cyborgs that uh <laughs> basically act like zombies once so, their once so their intelligence in, deteriorates and is it one of those cases where it's essentially a um essentially the machine is puppeteering what's left of the flesh yes uh -oh. Cause that's that's the that's the vibe I get looking at the cyborg concept. It's to use that to use that line from Return of the Jedi. He's more machine than man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the, the uh, so the cyborgs are a product of one of the well, of the uh, basically quote unquote bad guy faction of the humans, where mm -hmm. they were more corporate driven um, and doing just about anything they could, no matter how underhanded or unethical it was to try to win and take control over where humans are going in this place. Uh, cyborgs being one of those experiments and projects that they had that ended up backfiring on them. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the, the hosts, well, they, of course they had some volunteers, but there was also a program where if you died in, uh, you died in the line of duty, then you could donate your body towards, uh, future science. Um, or they would just go around, uh, uh, taking, prisoners of war and uh doing these horrible experiments to them mm. so that's where you end up with uh this uh that cyborg variant there is being is basically a reconnaissance and a scout and fast attack i think i have another cyborg somewhere i do it's in the uh updates uh, it's called the puppet there's mm. like a a late uh a 
a laborer, basically. Mm-hmm. And the big the big reason to ask is that there is whenever the concept of of some sort of self aware um, AI is present within science fiction, that creates a whole host of new questions to to answer. Sure does. <laughs> um, especially since it's inevitable that the question of "Am I a real boy?" is going is going to come up. <laughs> Not that exact phrasing, but I think you get the idea. Right. Yeah. That's uh, that's definitely what's uh, the, a lot of the characters. Uh, well, some of the characters end up facing with these these cyborgs. Is there's a entity that's kind of controlling all the other cy uh, cyborgs. It's kind of like a central command unit mm -hmm. that is basically skynetting out. Um, and it's like, oh, hey, uh, I don't want to die, so I'm going uh, to do everything I can to make sure that I don't, which involves a lot of cyborg uh, on human violence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... But uh, you also get these other AIs. That they're, like, for example, inside of the uh, the Spires, uh, there is actually an AI that was already there um, before the humans were born from their capsules that was kind of like directing them on how to do things. So you also have uh, some intervention from from AI that's were not man made. Yeah, and given the given the whole thing of of cyborg on on humanoid violence that might occur, are there are there certain weapons and tactics that humans have developed specifically to combat these cyborgs? Lots of guns and big numbers. Uh, so <laughs> the uh, our, our quote unquote good guy uh, faction, um, they uh, they figured out how they they recovered and restored some of the the cloning tech that brought them to this place in the first place, mm -hmm. and started using that to develop a, a, an army of clone soldiers. I'm guessing I'm guessing because of the fact that they had essentially developed their own cl their own. Um clone soldiers like this uh, the, those soldiers have certain physical advantages yes they are uh, tip, they're typically uh, stronger more resilient and can regenerate have better hearing and vision mm -hmm. or better senses and all, the, and the typical stuff from su regarding super soldiers right homegrown super soldiers mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm guessing and because of that whole genetic memory thing, I'm guessing that also applies to those those essentially super soldiers' use of um, weaponry. Like when they come they come out there, they relatively know how to how to use the guns that they're given. Yes, uh, they're basically while they're developing in their pods that they get they kind of get uh, mental programming on how to do how how to be a soldier. They they get educated while they're growing. Yeah, and it's funny that you also bring up the the genetic memory because that actually is something I have planned as a major plot point for one of our characters. Uh, seen in the, he's actually in the the more human stuff for a lot, right next to the robot. He has the white hair. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of the uh, He's uh, one of the clones, and actually, so he's getting a uh, genetic memory hop from previous clones uh so the so the original um template person um so they died in combat and they actually are the uh the biological parents of uh that redhead you see over there um <laughs> so uh so her biological parents were uh, were killed in combat on the mission of finding the the uh, finding and restoring the the cloning tech mm -hmm. uh so her dad ends up being the one that they use as the template. One, the uh, his, uh, the genetic memory that he had, well, basically, his, it's almost like his his conscience um, was because of the way that the, that it works. Uh, uh, his conscience was basically jumping from clone to clone, but there were, there was like gaps in his memory so he's having a difficult time understanding what's going on like he'd, he'll get like headaches and these dreams of being in like in in combat and dying on the battlefield is like but i was not clearly i was never there because i'm right here and i'm not dead mm -hmm. <laughs> so the the one that we have there he's getting a little bit closer and he actually ends up being what the the clone carrying that uh consciousness of uh her dad and ends up meeting her 
And is there a is there a telltale way to tell apart a nor a normal grown human from a um, clone? Um. So the the, the like the the, the first generation. Are you talking about like uh with the the clone soldiers or the yeah. the first generation humans? Um. Let's go with both. Okay, so the, the first generation humans were all, like, a, there were a bunch of templates that were taken, and they uh, they were all modified so that they have a bunch of, like, a big variety. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't really be able to tell, uh, the, like, no, they wouldn't look alike. The the clone soldiers, they all, when they're, basically when they're born from their tubes, they all look alike. They're just a bunch of uh, hairless guys that are, you know, they're, they're pretty tall, pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Um and after the you know after they do you know, what they would consider graduating which is deploying to your first combat uh, uh deployment um then they start to you know if you you if you live long enough you start to get these attributes like they they may start like personalizing themselves a little bit uh, uh, like uh, trying out different hairstyles or you know they might have some s scars that they earned in combat that help them identify one another like how droids in star wars develop quirks over time Yes. And I could... I can certainly see that. Now, with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to this particular art, art book, is this, is this meant to be a companion to the stories that you're writing? Is this meant to be a, sta a standalone presentation of the world? Where, where does it fit among that particular... Um, it's kind of a visual guide. Uh, so I, I can almost, like, for me, when uh, alongside the art, I also uh, want to have the the, the lore, behind, like, the, a little bit of, like, a, uh, the background on why this was created, as well as, like, the in-universe lore on uh, the subject, to kind of use it as a rule book for myself. So that way, you know, like, when writing a story, if I'm, like, uh, if... If I just for whatever reason happen to forget something in particular, writing in the story, and like, oh hey, this can't actually be because it says right here in the, the guide that they can't do that, then it's some you know something for me to follow, but as well as for anybody that you know, future projects that may stem from this. Yeah, I can, I can get that. So. What are you shooting for as far as a page count for this particular book? Um, let me calculate that real quick. Ah, uh, over a hundred, maybe about just about a hundred, uh, pr pretty close to a hundred. Because, mm -hmm. uh, about where I'm not sure exactly where, because I know certain. Uh, concepts are definitely are there are going to vary. Like some might be cheaper, some might be a little bit more expensive uh, to pay the uh, to the artist with. Um, but give or take around a hundred pages worth. Um, the, the, there's a lot, uh, definitely a lot of art that I want to put in there. Mm -hmm. I can I and I can certainly get behind that, and I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Yes. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that goes on around here. <laughs> I appreciate it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Delicious. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Hooah.